بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin in the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah and may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us through his book and guide our hearts and our minds and our days through his book and to forgive us uh, by virtue of his book. And this likely being the last session of uh, our study of Surah Yusuf, we ask Allah to forgive uh, our misspeaking about his book uh, and we ask Allah to grant us forgiveness also for our blurry intentions uh, for speaking about his book. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of the very special class of servants that are dedicated to his book. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that belong to our Allah, belong to Allah or Ahlina min al nas, uh, that are a very special class of people that especially belong to him. And they are the people of Quran, whom Ahlullahi wa khasatu. They are the people of God uh, and his most special servants, his most cherished servants. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of them. So we left off in the previous weeks with uh, the commentary, if we can call it that, about the story of Yusuf. So the last, you know, uh, 10 ayat or 9 ayat or so are a concluding uh, set of remarks about this surah and we ended with Allah Azza wa Jal saying that most people no matter how hard you try will not be believers uh, saying this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you know the audience of the Quran and then Allah Azza wa Jal said and most people do not believe in Allah except while still associating partners with him tonight's discussion will begin at the ayah of 107 of Allah Azza wa Jal saying أَفَأَمِنُ Do these people feel secure and تَأْتِيَهُمْ غَاشِيَةٌ مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ That uh, a blanket, if you will, of God's punishment will not overtake them, will not overwhelm them, will not smother them. أَوْ تَأْتِيَهُمُ السَّاعَةُ بَغْتَ Or that the hour itself will not befall them suddenly. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ so do these people feel when they worship Allah and worship others alongside him, when they play this uh, uh, risky game, disastrous game with Tawheed, um, do they feel secure from God's punishment? And you know, every human being is given innumerable chances to realize how fragile the human condition is. Every you know, reminder about our fragility is to help us stay insecure in a way that would guarantee our health and our well-being and our salvation. They are like ambassadors that they could serve as ambassadors, uh, you know, before the coming of Allah Azza wa punishment, which awaits the defiant. And so every time you taste hunger or experience headache or merely squint to see better or see any eyes, uh, you know, signs of uh, aging or, you know, bury a loved one, these are but flashes of our vulnerability in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. And notice Allah is saying, do they feel secure? Do, do they not take notice that there could be an unrelenting ghashiyah, smothering punishment that can blanket a person in torment in this life and the next? Or that the hour befall them, wahum la yash'urun. You know, you don't have to get punished in this world uh, by some, you know, uh, cosmic punishment. Um you could simply die and as soon as you die then the hour has come to you your hour has begun right um and so the hour comes to them while they are unaware you know throughout the quran allah Azzawajal's most intense punishment is reserved for those who remain heedless unaware right heedless unaware and that's why here in this ayah says suddenly while they are unaware and so what we should take from that is never stop renewing your repentance no matter how many times you fall, don't stay down. Don't be disgraceful by staying a criminal. Uh, you know, as Malcolm X, rahimahullah, used to say, there's nothing shameful about being a criminal. What's shameful, or he says disgraceful, is staying a criminal. And so never get caught dead a criminal, right? Never allow yourself to be in a position where you stay heedless, and then you are pulled from this life, having surrendered to that disgraceful state. Then the next ayah says to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa 
you just keep doing your duty. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Say to them, this is my path, I call to Allah. This is my way, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I uh, invite to God. You know, subhanAllah, just like Yusuf alayhi salam, uh, in call to Allah, regardless of the fluctuating emotional states that were happening to him throughout the journey, he even did it, you know, in the depths of the prison, so too is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being described here. Uh, you know, he is, alayhi salatu salam, about to be forced into exile out of Mecca, being dejected by his family and his clans and his people, his brethren from Quraysh. Yusuf alayhi salam was feeling dejected as well. He still called. Uh, and Ya'qub alayhi salam, in his pain also, he still called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said to them, A'lamu min Allahi ma la ta'lamun. I know about God what you don't know. And so it is as if Allah Azza wa Jal is, is saying to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the, at the back end of this story, O Muhammad, this is your path, da'wah. Whether you remain in Mecca or you find yourself forced into exile, you know, by the Meccans. Whether your supporters are by your side or you are, you know, dusting your hands from the burial of your supporters, you're still doing da'wah. You know, whether you are the persecuted preacher uh, or you are the powerful statesman, this is your path above all, so long as, you know, air remains in your lungs, you are a caller to Allah. That is your path above everything. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةً I call to Allah upon clear insight, you know, sound knowledge and, uh, you know, well-calculated strategy, wisdom, all of that is intended. Because, you know, when a Muslim does not call to God, call people to God upon clear insight, the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us and the way he exemplified for us, that very Muslim can contribute so much to the rejection of the message. So some aspects of lack of basira or weak basira insight is when you're not being gentle as the default when you're sharing the message or when you're not taking into consideration the cultural or the circumstantial variables, your context, where, where, you're, uh, where you're at, how your audience will understand these things. Um, also hypocrisy. Hypocrisy between one's preaching and one's conduct. Uh, and also having a poor command of the proofs that you are citing. When you cite certain proofs, you need to know that these are uh, the right proofs for the right reason. You're going to have to justify it. Also, sometimes the right proofs for one person are not the right proofs for another person, right? Because da'wah is like medicine. It's not like math. It's not like a, a set formula, 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, you need like a tailored approach. That's what basira is all about. Like you have to, like medicine, right? You need to know this patient's medical history, what they are and aren't allergic to, so that you can utilize the most effective methods of treatment for that particular person, customized. And you have to like identify what is the least invasive measure to administer. How do I get around their defenses? How do I not provoke their... Uh, like if you want to use the medical analogy a little bit further, how do I not provoke their like immune system to fight the treatment thinking it's like uh, dangerous? If you don't do these things, you're just, it's not going to work and it could actually be counterproductive. It could make things worse. You can kill a patient while attempting to treat him. Uh, if you're just like haphazard or, you know, you, you're reckless and you fall into, let's use the word malpractice since we're, we're, we're on a, a medical metaphor role here. <laughs> uh, so basira is important to be able to do all of this. And you know, some of the scholars, they said that that basira, insight, is the inward equivalent, the inward counterpart of basar, which is eyesight. Uh, it is your ability to like process and understand and decide based on what you're seeing. Because, you know, your basira is what determines that you, you're dealing with reality. You know, some people are, exist in the world, but they're so removed. They live in a bubble. They just refuse to acknowledge how the world functions. And so the caller has to be open to reality in order to rehabilitate his reality, his environment. Like, how can the caller open people's eyes when his eyes are closed, right? Forget bringing others to the truth he himself may not re even remain upon it when he gets involved in da'wah without basira. Like if, you're, if your footing in your faith as a Muslim stands on shifty ground, like you know, dogmatic platitudes, flimsy proofs, 
whether rational or textual, you don't have a strong command of these things, uh, you could be in trouble. You know, Muhammad al, al, Dr. Muhammad al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he used to say, I'm not afraid for the person who is thinking, like Basira, right, who is thinking, and then goes, to, goes astray as a result, because he'll eventually return to the truth. He said, my fear is for the person who's not thinking. Even if he happens to be rightly guided at the moment, he's still like a feather in the wind. Once he, the, it changes directions, once the breeze, the wind changes directions, he'll change directions as well, because he doesn't know why he's here. And so when you engage in the why you should be here versus there, the da'wah, right? You need to know why you, where you stand, where you stand. Uh, why you stand, where you stand. And then Allah Azza wa said, Say to them, O Muhammad, this is my path. I call to Allah upon Basira, me and those who follow me. And so it's not enough to be a Muslim without calling to Islam. Yeah, without formal training, you may have certain limitations, but it is not enough to claim the Prophet ﷺ is your Prophet without laying your claim to his path. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوِلَ اللَّهِ My path is that I call to Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, until you've exerted your effort, your capacity, that varies from person to person, but we all have some capacity to do da'wah, uh, to do what we can where we can to apply the hadith of convey on my behalf even if it's a single verse, right? We all have that responsibility as part and parcel of being uh, you know, followers of the Prophet because the ayah says, me and those who follow me. The ayah then ends by saying, وَسُبْحَانَ wa ma'ana min al-mushrikeen And glorified is Allah and I am not of those who set equals to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the relevance or the connection between that and da'wah? Because when the context is da'wah, calling people to God, it's not just, you know, us peacefully coexisting, which is, you know, fine, even if, you know, the da'wah is ineffective, if the da'wah is not fruitful. People don't become Muslim. We can still coexist with them, right? So, but this ayah is talking about da'wah, the exchange and the call and the propagation of the faith and invitation to it. When the context is da'wah and not just coexistence, clear stands have to be made. Like dif the differences do have to get pointed out, even if they're a little bit uncomfortable. There has to be a distinction, you know, for the Muslim in the Muslim's mind between being kind to those of other faiths and between blurring the lines of what constitutes valid faith in God's eyes, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes. And so the conversation of da'wah should always be civil, should always be polite, especially if the person you know, you're exchanging with is being civil and being polite. But, وَسُبْحَانَ wa مَعَنَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Glor SubhanAllah, glorified is Allah, and I'm not of the polytheists. Glorification of Allah is not just about believing in Him. It's about believing that none is worthy of our worship, our devotion, but Him. That is the essence of La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. This is the invalidity of, you know, attributing uh, the qualities of God or the rights of God to anyone uh, other than him, even if you're not the one doing it. I am not of the people that do it. I have, I'm, you know, uh, far removed from that. Not just do I don't do it. I don't accept, you know, or validate or approve of others doing it. And then the next verse goes on to speak about the previous messengers uh, who were rejected before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Allah tabaraka wa taala says, "Wa ma'usallam min qablika illa rijal al nuhi ilayhim," and we never sent before you except men that we reveal to min ahl al qura from the people of the cities or the people of the towns. Uh, why did Allah azza wa tell us that that they were men, right, from the people of the towns? You know, the, the earliest scholars of Islam said that this ayah is an indication that Allah never sent a messenger except that he was a male, he was an adult, he was a human being, and he was not a desert dweller, right? People of the towns. And the ultimate wisdom for that uh, choice, for that class of people, that type of people, uh, to have the highest office of religious leadership, only Allah knows the full wisdom. But there's a lot that can be inferred, right, about the effectiveness of the human being in particular, right, not a jinn, 
when refined by you know the positive effects of communal life, not just a desert dweller. And we spoke about this in previous weeks. Uh, you know, when Yusuf alayhi salam said, Allah did a great favor to pull you all out of the desert. Um, because the desert life does, you know, detract from a person's potential to achieve human excellence. So, you know, the human being as opposed to the jinn, the townsman, as a, you know, the, the communal person as opposed to the desert dweller, and then strengthened by, you know, the, the industriousness of manhood. Those three things together do have an effect towards maximizing the guidance of people. And perhaps, and this is a very strong perhaps, this is of the wisdoms why, Allah Azza wa chose them for prophethood. And then the ayah says, men of the towns, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Don't they roam the earth? Don't people roam the earth? Uh, and see the consequences of those before them? You know, so a person should send their feet roaming, travel the earth, or at least send your mind roaming, right? Consider realize how history repeats itself you know and how the accounts of those that face the consequences the perished nations that were destroyed before us uh can be such a uh a, a salvation insurer for us while we still have a chance to avert destruction you see when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during the battle of tabuk he uh passed through the ruins of a perish perished nation right the people of ad and thamud he warned the companions to do a few things. He warned them to accelerate their pace, to not stop and drink from the water of those wells in those towns. And he told them to never pass through such places except while weeping or taking, you know, a profound lesson from it. Because there's so much to be learned here, right? The Quran tells us that history and reality, it, it's rational. The past is logical. The patterns of human civilizations are obvious. But what is not obvious or not, you know, often enjoyed are people that are blessed with the pause, to give themselves pause and to, to benefit from this, to aptly consider what happened here and how that's not very different from us. And so the early Muslims were not like this. The early Muslims were very uh, thoughtful, very mindful, very reflective. You know, Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, rahimahullah, he used to say that every time I emerge from my home, not even traveling, right? When I emerge from my home, my eye does not fall on anything except that I notice Allah's favor on me because of it. Whatever I see causes me to notice how blessed I am by Allah and or a lesson for me from it. You know, that Allah spared me or Allah's warning me or otherwise, right? There's something there. And, you know, the great companion, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he used to say that a moment of reflection, a pause and reflection, is superior than standing for an entire night in worship. And so this is the mentality of any intelligent person, let alone a believer. And then Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, وَلَدَارُ الْأَخِرَةِ خَيْرٌ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ after, don't they see the consequences of the previous nations? Don't they travel and see this? And the home of the hereafter is superior, is better for for the God-fearing. Do you not understand? And so after speaking about, just to connect it now, after speaking about the previous nations, Allah contrasts them uh, with the believers who rightly lived, properly lived in fear of Allah, in apprehension of His wrath. And so, like in the in the tafsir of this ayah, uh, Al Imam Al Al Biqai rahimahullah uh, Al Biqai he said about this ayah, the believers they were driven by this fear to create using their righteousness, right, their acts of obedience, their acts of abstention from sin, a protection between them and settling for this life that must end at death. So he says, even if one, and they realize that even if a person were to enjoy it, enjoy this world with the utmost luxury and the utmost painlessness for a thousand years, he still has to die. And so like best case scenario, you're still going to die. And so they, the believers 
are the ones that are going to enjoy the, the home of the hereafter because they were God-fearing and their fear of God got them to do the right thing and not settle for a world that its best case scenario is death. And he says this is the meaning or the intended meaning of this ayah here. And then the next ayah, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala speaks about the reaction of the messengers when their nations belied. And he said, حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا Until, you know, they, the, we sent messengers, people of the towns, don't you see what we did to the people of the towns? And as for the God-fearing, the home of the hereafter is, is a great homecoming for them. Don't you understand? Then it, the story resumes until when the messengers have despaired, the messengers lost hope and thought that they were belied, thought that they were belied, our help came to them. So what does that mean? This I actually used to confuse me. Uh, like how could anyone with firm belief in Allah despair in him? Impossible. So how did the messengers despair? How did the messengers lose hope? And then years later, when I read the tafsir, uh, you know, I, I kind of got slapped up. I, my senses got slapped into me <laughs> uh, by my mother, by my mother, the mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu anha. She said about this ayah, ma'ad Allah. She said, I seek Allah's refuge, like from such a thought. Someone actually asked her, how did the messengers despair? It wasn't just me. Uh, and she said, uh, the messengers would never assume this of their Lord. They would never assume that their Lord lied to them or that they're you know, not going to be supported as Allah promised. She said, this is about the followers of the messengers who believed in their Lord and accepted the messengers. But then the tribulations, like the hard times, continued for such a long period and there was no victory in sight. And so when there was no victory in sight, the messengers despaired in what? despaired in their people believing. They despaired in the disbelievers, any more of the disbelievers, you know, turning a new leaf. And they presumed that their followers had lost faith in them. That they were going to be called liars by their followers. And then it was at that moment that our victory came to them. That the victory of Allah came to them. So that is the interpretation of Aisha radiallahu anha on this verse. This verse could also be read a little bit differently. It could also be read to mean that the messengers lost hope in their people believing. Uh, that part is the same. And then they thought they were belied. They thought they were uh, belied means the disbelievers now. They the disbelievers, the rejecters of faith. Sorry, my notes are all over the place. The rejecters of faith became confident that they were for sure lied to by the messengers. There really is no punishment coming. Then the punishment came. And, you know, this shows you, subhanAllah, that all of the prophets, almost every single one of them, they were minorities, right? And, you know, God's wrath for the rejecters has an appointment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَعْجَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّمَا نَعُدُّ لَهُمْ عَدَّ Don't be hasty, you know, we're counting down their days. Likewise, you know, on the opposite end, the victory of Allah is not just earned. You qualify, but then you wait. You stay qualifying until Allah Azza wa says, you know, you've passed the test. And, you know, His messengers were always deserving of victory. But, حَتَّى إِذَا stay as a الرُّسُلُ Once the messengers, you know, despaired, you know, felt it was such a dead end, things were so difficult. You know, the other verses with Al-Baqarah, do you think you'll enter Jannah? And before it comes to you, what came to the messengers before you, they were afflicted with suffering and hardship uh, until the me the messenger and the believers said, when is the victory of Allah coming, right? They were they were shaken to the core. So this is this is the path, and that is when the victory of Allah comes. And also this reminds you that Islam will never go extinct. There were many instances in history, just in the history of this ummah, but even before this ummah, when that nearly happened, right? That Islam was wiped out. But the true believers always knew better. They saw with the eyes of faith that 
This was only made to appear that way by Allah's leave. The tyrants were just given more rope by which to hang themselves, as they say, right? And Allah also delays it to filter our ranks from those unwilling to pay the cost and those unworthy of being honored, you know, uh, with the high levels of paradise, with the ranks of martyrdom en route, and so on and so forth. And then Allah says, and our severity, our severe punishment is not averted from the wrongdoing people or the criminal people, the guilty people. And so rejecting the messengers is a crime. Like every person has a choice, but we have to assert that this is a bad choice. Islam believes in the equality of human beings, but not in the equality of human behavior. It's very different, right? That means all human beings are inherently entitled to being dignified by virtue of being human. Their humanness means they get dignified. But that doesn't mean that those dignified human beings, when they stubbornly reject God's message, after discovering it, of course, that they are not punishable by God on the day that they meet God. That must be understood. And then, the very last ayah in the surah, uh, ayah 111, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ In their stories, a lesson for those who possess intelligence. This is not a fabricated tale, but a confirmation of what came before it, and a detailed explanation of all things, and a guidance and a mercy for people who believe. I will actually opt out of reflecting on this verse here and now. Uh, let us leave it for another uh, night so that we can have our 29th video to end on an odd number because that's sunnah and also because it's, it's, it would take too long uh, to cover all of the points in this ayah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this humble effort sincerely for his sake. And I pray that it has some sort of benefit in bringing some people closer to his book and nearer to him through his book. And may we not be deprived of the reward, us and our families and our parents and our children. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khayyan everybody. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.